Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Mary set out and went as quickly as she could to a town in the hill country of Judah. She went into Zacharias' house and greeted Elizabeth. Now as soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She gave a loud cry and said, Of all women you are the most blessed, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why should I be honored with a visit from the mother of my Lord? For the moment your greeting reached my ears, the child in my womb left for joy. Yes, blessed is she who believed that the promise made her by the Lord would be fulfilled. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit exalts in God my Saviour, because he has looked upon his lowly handmaid. Yes, from this day forward, all generations will call me blessed. For the Almighty has done great things for me, holy is his name. And his mercy reaches from age to age for those who fear him. He has shown the power of his arm, he has routed the proud of heart. He has pulled down princes from their thrones and exalted the lowly. The hungry he has filled with good things, the rich sent empty away. He has come to the help of Israel, his servant, mindful of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, of his mercy to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back home. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God's family, dear brothers and sisters, we celebrate today the solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into heaven. Putting things more in detail, we are rejoicing and praising God today for having taken our Blessed Mother, the Mother of Jesus, body and soul into heaven when her life on earth came to an end. There, Mary now shares in the life and joy of her Son, as fully as she is capable of, and more intensely than any other human being ever will. We should not think that what I stated right now expresses all that can be said about this feast. May the Holy Spirit, through the explanation of the readings we have heard, help us to go deeper into the mystery of the Assumption of our Blessed Mother. In view of the fact that Mary was to become the mother of Jesus, God granted to her particular favors, which he never granted to anyone. They are more or less privileges. Of course, God loves every person that comes into the world. But it was only too fair that he should bestow uh, special favors on the one he had chosen to be the mother of his son on becoming man. They are special favors or privileges. Three are the main privileges or favors God bestowed on Mary, which have not been granted to anyone else, as far as we know. First, to start with, God hastened to fill Mary's soul with the life in the Spirit the very moment she was conceived in the womb of her mother and she was preserved from all sorts of sin, original sin. We call this privilege the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Let us try to make clear what this privilege means. We all come into the world deprived of the Spirit of God, the sanctifying grace, the life in the Spirit, and we remain deprived of it until we are baptized. Mary instead was granted the life in the Holy Spirit, the sanctifying grace, the very moment she started living. Not for a moment was she without that life in the Spirit. 
But having come to this point, let us make the following point clear. No one, not even Mary, is entitled of the sanctifying grace or the gift of the Holy Spirit to, uh, to sharing in God's own life on his own. Jesus obtained that life for his mother too at a very high price through his death and resurrection. Therefore, Mary too owes the sanctifying grace, the life in the Spirit, to her son. Or in other words, Mary too was redeemed by Christ. In the case of Mary, the redemption was applied to her before the thing happened. While Jesus communicates to us the life in the Spirit, the sanctifying grace at baptism, that is, after having paid the price for it by his death, he communicated to it, communicated it to his mother in advance, in a preservative way, so to say, that is, even before he became man in your womb. Of course, he could do it because he was God. We could put this another way. Jesus would one day receive his human life from Mary. He, for that, hastened to thank her for her future gift with his own gift by communicating divine life to her the moment she was conceived. The second favor of God to Mary was her sinlessness and holiness. Sooner or later, we all succumb to temptation and commit sin, even in spite of baptism. God saw to it that sin would never touch uh, the mother of Jesus. She was tempted during her life, yes, just as we all are, but she always came out victorious from her temptation. This privilege was granted to Mary in view of her being Jesus' mother. It would have been a shame for Jesus, who had come into the world to destroy sin, to see her mother as sinner woman. No, the devil would never be able to boast of a single victory over her because of a special grace that was given to her, that she remained sinless. She was all holy. The third privilege granted by God to Mary is the one we are celebrating today, that at the end of her life she was taken up body and soul into heaven. When we speak about Mary, the mother of Jesus, we might run the risk of making her so unreal to consider her totally different from what we are. A woman to be praised to the skies, whose heroism but we cannot uh, copy. We might even think that with all the graces she received, her life was super easy. It was a great fun. And we are wrong. We are wrong. Uh, had we one day visited Nazareth and asked to see Mary, we would have surprised, we would have been surprised to find Mary just like any other woman. No different in appearance from any other woman in the village. No different in her struggles and difficulties. The special favors God granted to her were indeed extraordinary, but they did not make Mary's life easier than ours. She was subject to temptation, to anxieties, to sorrow, to dis disappointment, just as we are. The difference between her and us lies somewhere else, that is here. Mary said yes to God at every step, while we, foolishly, often say no to God's plans of love for us. Often, Mary had to say yes to God in total darkness, without knowing the future, led only by the light of faith, when God's plans did not seem to make sense at all. Time and again, to pronounce that yes entailed sorrow, anxiety, uncertainty, just as it happens with us. For example, she said yes at the Annunciation, submitting to God's plan as the handmaid of the Lord, when, in spite of the words of the angel, so many things about her future remained unclear. She said yes again uh, at Bethlehem, 
when Jesus was born in the midst of so much property and repeated her yes, her heart torn by anxiety when told to flee to Egypt. She said yes when the son Jesus was lost in the temple and she went on seeking, searching uh, until she found him. Found him. She said yes to God at Nazareth for 30 years. At every event, sad and joyful. We can be sure that throughout those years, the Holy Family experienced many anxious moments, such as poor families have to experience everywhere. She said yes to her loneliness when Jesus left her a poor widow to go and start his preaching. When news reached Nazareth that Jesus was opposed, or still worse, that his life was threatened, Mary had to accept, and she lived that torment. And above all, Mary gave her silent yet decided yes in the midst of a sea of sorrow at the foot of the cross. When Jesus requested her to take the whole mankind under her motherly care as she let go of her only son, she said that yes. Not even after Jesus' resurrection, things went smooth for Mary. She had agreed to his son's plans to be the mother to the infant church, to bestow her motherly care upon it as she had bestowed it on her when on him when he was a child. We can imagine Mary's anxiety when the church was persecuted right from the start, and above all, when divisions arose within the Christian community, or when she heard that someone had betrayed his or her faith in her son. Mary's Christian life was not in any way easier than our own. Yet God always found her exactly as he wanted her to be a child, a beloved daughter, always faithful, always open to his plans, always ready to carry them out as best as she could. That is why we call her the first disciple of Jesus, who accepted God's word and made that word a home in her heart. She is for us both a mother and a model in our life. The church has chosen as gospel passage today the visitation of Mary to her cousin Elizabeth soon after the Annunciation had taken place. The reason for the choice is a confirmation of what we said above. While we rejoice at our mother's glorification in heaven, we should learn to see her at our side in our daily life, showing us how to respond to God's love the way she did, or God's will the way she did. Let us closely examine the narration of the visitation as told by Luke. Having learned from the angel that her cousin Elizabeth was about to give birth to a child, Mary set out as quickly as she could to visit her, to help her. It was a long and dangerous journey for a girl of her age, about 145 kilometers. Yet she did not think of herself but of the need of, uh, but the need of helping her cousin. The moment Mary greeted her cousin, Elizabeth, moved by the Spirit, praised Mary for just one reason, for having believed in God's message, that is, for having submitted to God's plans without questioning. Blessed are you among women, for you have believed what the Lord has told you. Mary, in turn, moved by the Holy Spirit, burst forth into a hymn of praise to God, the hymn we call the Magnificat, from his first word in Latin. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He looks on his servant in her lowliness. Henceforth, all ages will call me blessed. The Spirit led Mary to see her own loneliness and God's inexhaustible mercy, God's faithfulness in fulfilling his every promise. Finally, Luke ends up his narration by telling us that Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back home. 
you can be sure that her stay must have been remembered for a long time after she left. She must have started work the moment she ended her song of praise, carrying out the task that any woman performs when going to help a relative about to give birth. She kept the house clean, prepared the food, nursed her cousin when her delivery came, looked after the babe nearly born, was at all times a source of joy and peace to the people around. When her help was no longer needed, she went back to Nazareth to go through the anxiety of being unable to explain her motherhood to Joseph or to others. She left matters in God's hands and eventually God did come to her rescue, revealing to Joseph what had taken place in her. The extraordinary manifestations of God to Mary were few and far between. For most of her life, Mary went on with her daily task quietly, accepting the joys and sorrows of life, putting her trust in God at all times. That is, God guided Mary in life as he guides us all, and Mary went on through it guided by her faith. This is a key thing. Faith hope and love, guided by a faith, humbly asking God for light to discover his plans in the events of everyday life and strength to carry it out. It was this faithfulness of Mary to God at all times that brought to her the glory of her assumption into heaven. In this Sunday's second reading taken from the first letter of St. Paul to the Christians of Corinth, St. Paul tells them and tells us that Christ is like the first fruits of a rich harvest, a harvest of glory and happiness in heaven. Jesus rose first and entered into glory. But on entering heaven, he left the gates wide open for those who belong to him to follow and share in his own glory. In heaven, the sharing in God's glory is in proportion to our faithfulness to Christ while on earth. That is what belonging to Christ really means. The more we belong to him, the more closer we shall be to him in heaven. And since no one has ever belonged to Jesus as completely as Mary did, no one will share in his glory as intensely as Mary shares. The first reading taken book from the book of Revelation, we are told of the Ark of the Covenant in heaven and of a woman who gives birth to a child, mother and the child being saved from a dragon that threatened both. This passage admits several meanings. It can also apply to Mary as follows. In the Old Testament, God chose to dwell in the Ark of the Covenant a portable sanctuary which accompanied the people of Israel through the desert on their way to the promised land. The Ark of the Covenant was a box in which was a manna, the manna, the food they got, the flowering rod of Aaron, as well as the commandments, the Ten Commandments. But this Ark is a fitting symbol of Mary in whose womb Jesus dwelt for nine months. Because around the ark, on the ark, God dwelt. And here the ark, Mary, in her womb, Jesus dwelt. The woman too is a symbol of Mary who gave birth to the firstborn Jesus. The devil, represented by the dragon, could do nothing against Jesus who was God, who was to rule the world with the iron rod, the Messiah. Neither could he do anything against Mary, whom God protected from the devil's snares. And this woman, therefore, will be the fulfillment of the prophecy that you find in the book of Genesis, that the woman, her feet, together with the son's feet, will crush your head. Thus, the glory of Mary at her assumption is the fruit of both of God's love for her and her faithfulness to God throughout her life. And that too will be the reason for our glory. The grace of God working within us, in other words, God's love in our hearts, and our faithfulness, our response to that love throughout our life, 
Mary's example should encourage all of us to belong to Christ ever more decidedly so as to share one day in Jesus' glory together with our mother. While living in this world and engaged in many activities, we should not lose sight of heaven as our final destiny, this life with God and all our loved ones, the holy saints of God. Mary assumed into heaven, she invites us to look up to heaven and long for it all through our pilgrimage here on earth. That is, to look up to God and long to be with God all through our pilgrimage here on earth. And uh, there is a beautiful hymn that the church prays. It were my soul's desire to see the face of God. It were my soul's desire to rest in his abode. It were my soul's desire when heaven's gate is won to find my soul's desire clear, shining like the sun. This still my soul's desire, whatever life afford, to gain my soul's desire and see thy face of God. And we pray. Father in heaven, may the example of our blessed mother lead us to an ever greater faithfulness to Christ, that at our death we may be taken into heaven, there to share his own triumph and that of our son who lives and reigns with you, one God forever and ever. Amen. Mother dear.